G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru and today we're starting off a new series on my channel um, which is looking at the software Rhino um, which is quite exciting because we haven't done any videos on Rhino yet um, so we're going to do what I'm calling a crash course today so uh, thanks for the request, a lot of people on my channel have requested not only Rhino but also Grasshopper um, so I'm aiming to release more videos as I learn this software I'm still quite new to it um, but I will be uh, releasing them as I learn more so this video is mainly for people that have close to zero experience with Rhino um, or very little experience um, and to ideally people that like design and computation because this is what Rhino excels at. People that are looking to get started quite quickly as well and probably like me, you're rushing into Grasshopper. That's the reason you've probably picked up Rhino. So Rhinoceros. So Rhino is a 3D CAD software made by McNeil and Associates. Um, it's highly known for its accuracy, its precision, and the power of its geometry engine versus other software such as ArchiCAD or Revit. Um, and it's home to Grasshopper, which is an embedded uh, system within Rhino um, that you can really easily install. And it's a computational design tool at its source. So Rhino um, looks a little bit like this. So you can either do very organic or very freeform work, um, or you can do more rigid things such as uh, architecture. So it has a variety of uses. Um, it can also be used for things like jewelry design, things that are quite small scale, so it doesn't just deal with large scale elements. But again, it's very precise, so it can deal with um, large scale coordinate systems. So Rhino versus Revit is a common thing that comes up uh, in my industry. Um, there's some quite opposite and polar opinions about it. In my opinion, they're both programs for specific things. They do different things very well. And at the end of the day, it's all software. It's all trying to achieve an output. So whatever is best for the job is the best tool. So Rhino is very conceptual, organic. It focuses on uh, quality, geometry, and precision. And it also is very interoperable. It can handle a lot of file format types and also produce a lot of file format types. So you might know uh, that it might be used for 3D printing quite a lot because it creates STL formats, for example. Whereas Revit is more focused towards documentation. It's fairly rigid, so it deals with constraints and reference plans. Um, it's a BIM platform at its source. Essentially, it's made to deliver BIM models, whereas Rhino is made to deliver a variety of models, not just BIM models. And it's centered around the Autodesk uh, platforms, So, whereas Rhino is more interoperable. So Grasshopper, um, you might have heard of it. Essentially, it's a coding, a visual coding language um, that you can attach to Rhino, which is a little bit like Dynamo for Autodesk, but you can achieve very complex forms very quickly. So my series will eventually reach out to Grasshopper uh, to show you how the program works and to show you tutorials and how to build things for Grasshopper. Um, so Grasshopper versus Dynamo is worth touching on. Dynamo is the visual coding la language embedded in Revit. Um, so Grasshopper interacts with Rhino. It's very strong because it has Rhino's geometry engine and its emphasis is on design exploration from my experience, but it can do a variety of things. It's pretty much just limited by the creativity of the user and of the community, which from what I've seen is very creative. Whereas Dynamo is a little bit newer than Grasshopper, it hasn't been around as long. It interacts with Revit. Um, it relies on Revit's geometry engine, which is a lot weaker, unfortunately, so it's also a lot slower. However, Dynamo's emphasis is more so on data and automation. Uh, at its source, it's there to speed up Revit processes. So it's much more fit for purpose than Grasshopper at this. Um, so again, very different purposes and both very useful and relevant pieces of software. So let's actually check out Rhino. So this is the crash course. Um, essentially, I'm just gonna jump into Rhino and just run through some of the basics to get you started. So this is more or less what Rhino will look like when you open it, except for a few color changes, which I'll show you how I made shortly. So there's a few panels that you'll notice straight away. So you have a properties and layer and display tab over here. So you can obviously tap between these three. I'll run through these shortly. You have a lot of tabs here that basically conceal a whole bunch of tools. Uh, but likewise, you also have drop downs that contain most of these tools as well in menu format, if you so choose. Whereas typically most people tend to work through here or through the command line. So nearly all of these uh, buttons have a command associated with them as well, or multiple commands associated with them, similar to AutoCAD if you've used that before. So if I was gonna create a line or a polyline, I can click and start drawing my polyline, uh, right click to finish, but I can also type in line and create a line this way as well. And you'll see that you get a lot of options for most of these commands. So you can type in the letter that is the shortcut of each of these to toggle them. So let's just do a, uh, let's just do a vertical line. 
and then you can do the start of the line and because I picked vertical line you'll see that I'm constrained to the z-axis and there you go I've created the line in terms of navigating the interface that's quite easy as well so if you hold down your right mouse button that will orbit if you hold down shift and your right mouse button that pans and the mouse wheel will zoom you in and out so if you combine these three you can navigate through this space quite easily um, likewise you've got different tabs in your views so for example I have a top view a front view and a right view these are a little bit different so you'll see in top view I'm obviously seeing from the top of my model um, likewise front and right are different again but you're always seeing the same information so it's a bit like Revit um, in that what you see is coincident between all the viewports. You can change what your viewports show by just clicking on this arrow next to your views and you can actually toggle uh, going set view and you can pick a different one. So you could have two perspectives, for example, at once. Likewise, you can also change the graphic style of the views here as well. So I can pick a whole variety of styles. Because I've only drawn lines, you can't really see the difference between them yet. So we'll get there shortly. Um, so when you do a command in Rhino, a really handy thing that I found is you can repeat the last command you did by right clicking. So if I create a polyline and then I right click to finish and then I right click again, it actually prompts me to start another polyline. So when you're doing repetitive tasks, this can be a really handy little shortcut to know quite early in using Rhino. Okay. So probably the next best place to go is probably to check out your files units. So if you go to file properties, this is basically the, the document properties. So there's quite a lot of settings in here. It's worth having a look at all of these just to get you familiar. Um, note that I'm using Rhino 5. So Rhino 6 is actually the current version of Rhino. I'm just using Rhino 5 currently and we'll probably transition to 6 later in the series. So if you go under units in document properties, we can check out our model units and we can change these at any time uh, to the suitable unit that we want. And you can set tolerances and angle tolerances, how distances are displayed um, and the display precision. So there's a lot of ways you can change your units, but also how your units display in your model. Um, at the moment, you might notice that my background is white. So under appearance in colors, you have the ability to customize nearly everything that the display would show you, which I find really helpful. So by default, everything's a little bit more gray, a bit more washed out. It's a bit harder to see. Um, likewise, you can actually toggle the grid settings as well. So you can set your grid spacing for your major and minor grids, or you can just turn off your grid if you want. And also you can turn off your grid, grid axes. So there's a lot of flexibility um, to how you can customize the interface of the program very quickly and very easily. All right, um, so note that I was speaking about our viewports before. So if you go to your viewport layout tab, you have more customization over how your viewports are set up. So if you're working in just one view, you can really quickly just pick your viewpoint and maximize or restore. So I do this a lot when I'm just working in 3D or if I'm using something like Grasshopper, where I just wanna see a 3D preview. Likewise, you can really quickly toggle between three viewports, four, um, and there's a lot of different settings as well. So you can split viewports as well into two. Um, so I find that's a really helpful tab to learn quite early in Rhino. You can also toggle between perspective types. So I can do a orthographic projection or a two point perspective um, or just a standard perspective. So I'll just go back to my, my four viewports. I think I'm still in two point at the moment. Looks like that's fixed it. Okay, um, so from there, we're probably gonna jump onto just how to create very basic elements. So we'll just start with the most basic element first, which is a point. So the point is located here. Um, if you left click, you'll do a single point, but note that most of these tools have two options each. So note that the point has a multiple point option. So if I right click, I can place multiple points in my model. And then just, I'll go back to my select tool. I can also select elements and up here in the command bar, it will tell you what you currently have selected, which can be really helpful when you're working in quite a complex model that has quite a lot of elements. Um, later on, I'll show you that there's other ways to select elements more easily as well. Um, you can also go to your properties palette and check what you're dealing with as well. So you can see a lot of properties about what you're looking at. So you're a little bit like AutoCAD, you have display color, line type, print color. By default, everything works by layer. So Rhino has a layer management system uh, a little bit different to Revit, more similar to AutoCAD. Um, so 
we'll just quickly check the properties of this element. So if you go to details, you'll get a lot of information about what you have selected. Um, so you can see there we have a whole bunch of points um, and a whole bunch of IDs. So each element essentially is telling us all its properties. So that's really helpful as well. You can obviously save this data as well as a TXT file, um, which can be great for processing these elements into other software that can read text files. Okay. So from points, we can also generate lines. We have polylines, we have control point curves, uh, squares, circles, many ways to generate circles and ellipses. Um, so have a play with all of those. Most of them are stored under curve tools. Um, you can see we have a whole bunch of ways of generating elements. Um, so I won't even show you them all because there's just so many of them. Um, obviously curves by control point is quite handy. So as you add more control points, you'll get a more flexible curve. And I'll just keep that to go to the next point. So most elements uh, have a lot of functions that can be applied upon them. Some of them are just things like transforms, something as simple as a move command. So if I select this and go move, note that we get the option to toggle to vertical. So I'll just click on this to do vertical yes. And there we go, we can move in the Z axis. Um, likewise, you can also type in your translation as well. Um, we have things like copy, but there's more complex things like soft editing. Uh, we have rotation, scaling, mirroring. So we have the typical commands you'd expect in a CAD software. We have things like arrays and polar arrays. Uh, but then we have more interesting ones like bending, uh, flowing along curves. So really experiment with these, mostly with solids. Um, you'll note that some of them are quite interesting to work with. Uh, there's a lot of curve tools as well for manipulating curves. Um, if you need to change an element that is point driven, all you need to do is select it and just go to standard and just turn on edit points. And now you see that I can see the points of my line. And I can go and pick them and drag them around and very easily I can edit my line. Um, but one of the, the great things about uh, Rhino is that you don't just have to deal with one direction of axis with movement. So I can combine other commands. So I can call on my move command and I can say vertical, and I can also take that point and move it up. And you'll note that my curve now is operating in all three dimensions. So really cool, and it's really flexible as well. So obviously if I move other points around, everything adjusts to suit. So this is sort of the power of the Geometry Rhino engine, uh, or the Rhino Geometry engine. Obviously this is a very small display of what it can do, um, but immediately that's something we can't do in something like Revit very easily. So very cool. Um, we've got other tools as well to deal with um, surfaces and solids. So they're another class of elements. So we have the surface from three or four corner points. Um, so I can go one, two, three, four and generate a surface. Um, likewise, I can check its properties. So you'll see it's a NURB surface currently with four edges of boundary um, and it's a valid surface. So it tells you whether the geometry is also uh, okay as well. It will give you warnings if things don't work. I'll show you what I mean in a second with that. So let's just go to shaded view so it's more obvious what we're looking at. Um, what you can also do is we can generate solids. So let's just do a box uh, and we'll just do it by center. So we'll just click generate a box and generate a height to that box. Okay, so now we have a box. Um, so two commands that are quite handy are explode and join in Rhino. So the first one, explode, is just here. But likewise, you can also just explode. And what that will do is dissolve it down into the next layer of geometry that defines that element. So now you can see we have uh, four, four sides, a top and a bottom of our cube. I might just quickly change this into a new perspective view just to fix my perspective. Which I might be able to fix that here. Cool. Now I'm in true perspective. And I might just maximize this viewport. Okay, so now we have a bunch of surfaces. Um, so let's say we want to get rid of this surface and just create like an open box like that. So what I can do is actually select all of these and I can join them as well or type in join. And we end up with a surface uh, or a poly surface, um, which in, in Rhino has a special name, which is a B-Rep. Um, so if I go and check my details, we now have a poly surface with five surfaces. Um, and note that it's not a closed surface as well. Um, so it's important to understand that we can't treat that as a closed object. 
Um, there are lots of commands for closing elements. Um, I won't go through them all now because they're not super important for transitioning into Grasshopper, but they may be important um, for later on when you're dealing with solids. So what I'll do is just create another solid and I'll just show you Boolean operations as well because they're quite important to understand. So let's take this, this box and then we'll create a, a sphere. So for a sphere, we'll just expand this element here. And you'll see we get a whole bunch of um, elements that we can generate instead. So not just our square. So each of these tools usually has other tools hiding within it. So let's create a, a sphere by center radius. So I've got my cat standing on my keyboard. <laughs> Shaky bugger. Okay. So now we've got a sphere. You can see it overlapping our box. Um, so let's do a Boolean operation. So we can obviously join these elements, but let's do a difference. So you'll see it prompts us to select surfaces or polysurfaces. So we're going to uh, delete from here and we're going to use this element as our cutting element. So unlike 3ds Max, um, the element is sort of baked into the result. So this hole is now a part of this element. So this is a resultant form. You can't just extract those elements back out by clicking like an undo form button. So this becomes part of the element. So keep in mind when you build um, that things are going to sort of commit as you do them. Obviously you can undo and redo to get that back. Um, let's just uh, explode that element and join that element. So again, you'll see we have an open polysurface because we've taken away that face. So it's really important to understand when your edges are open um, because obviously I can't 3D print this object. So really important to keep in mind. Um, you can see there in the type, it tells me it's open as well. There are a lot of ways of well, ways to patch um, these elements up. Um, so I recommend that you look these up um, before you use Grasshopper if they're relevant to what you're doing. Uh, but there's a lot of ways to do it. Okay. So that's some of the basic operations geometrically you can do in Rhino. Um, but obviously I've only really done some very basic uh, actions. Um, so let's have a look at just something really quickly before. So if I make two points and I create a line between those two points, we may expect that these elements are connected, but they're not. So note that when my point moved, my line didn't move with it. Um, that's because we're not working with Grasshopper yet. So if you've seen elements pull elements around, typically that's because Grasshopper is actually establishing a relationship between them. So when we look at Grasshopper, these elements will become connected or derived. Um, so really important. Um, there's a lot of other ways to join solids um, in Grasshopper, and most of these functions are actually contained in Grasshopper as well as, as Rhino. So there's a lot of ways. You can see there's some capping functions in here to cap holes in your model. Um, but there's also other ways that you can fill it elements, you can move away from faces, um, you can make holes. There's all sorts of functions you can use to create solids. And then there's also mesh functions on top of that. Uh, but we probably won't get into meshes because they're quite complicated. Um, so just keep in mind there's a whole bunch of tools to play with. Um, so for example, an extrusion. Some of these elements are applied on another class of elements. So if I create a surface and I apply a extrude function, under solids. Um, that's basically turning the surface into a solid. So let's extrude this. And now you can see we're generating a different geometry type from our surface. Keep in mind that our original element is kept uh, unless we specify to delete the source in the properties of our extrusion. But you see now we have a closed poly surface. And again, we can check the properties if we so choose. There you go, valid poly surface, and it's a closed poly surface. So that's really important to note because usually we want, we want close geometry in our results. Um, last of all, I'll just show you the layer management system because that's quite important to understand as well. So by default, Rhino comes with five layers and default. Um, you can generate new layers, obviously, and give them whatever name you want. So I could call this box, for example. Um, you can obviously turn layers off and also lock them as well if you don't want to be able to select them or move them around. It's important to pick a color for your layer as well. That's easy to see. Better not to pick yellow because yellow is the default selection color in Rhino. Um, if you want to change the layer of an element, um, there's a couple of ways to do it. So I believe that if you come down here, you can set the layer there and see that the color of the geometry changes. And you can also select the element, right click, and I think it's change object layer. 
and that assigns all the elements you have selected currently. So really, um, really handy for sorting elements, but you can also add sublayers as well. So you can group your layers by a common element. Say you have two buildings and you want to separate their layers. This is how you could do it. And I believe you can nest sublayers below that as well. So sublayers can go quite deep, obviously. Um, if I associate this element to sublayer two, change object layer, and I turn off the, the, the highest layer, note that all the other elements turn off as well. So just, um, just a way to manage all your elements, which becomes quite important. If you double click, it changes your active layer. If I lock my layer, I can't lock my parent layer, but if I lock this layer, you see now I can't select these elements. Um, so really important. Probably the, the last tab worth showing before I finish up is just the visibility and, and graphics control. So I think it's under display. No, it's under visibility. So there's a whole bunch of options here for hiding and showing objects in, in Rhino. So I can take, say, another one of these. And actually, I've just made a copy of this um, on top of itself. Note that when you have a lot of elements really close to each other in Rhino, it actually gives you a little selection menu. It's very friendly. It's saying, I don't know what you're trying to move, so I'll let you pick something. I'll pick my poly surface, and there it is. Um, now that it's out of the way, I can just select one thing again. But likewise, copy, paste. Which one do you want? I want this one. So it's really easy to handle things even when they're overlapping. Really important. Um, you can, I think you can drag with Alt selected in order to duplicate as well. Just double check. I think it's Shift. Uh, that's okay, I'll look at that later. There's a lot of shortcuts in Rhino that even I'm still sort of getting used to. But the reason why I made a few of these is that I want to just start hiding a few of them. So we can hide, and we can hide. And if we want to show, we can just right click. Um, likewise, we can also just type in show. Um, and likewise, we can also hide by typing in hide. So um, really easy. And you can also lock elements as well. So I can take this element and lock it. And you'll see that it grays out when it's locked. And now I can't manipulate that element. Likewise, we can also unlock all objects as well. I can also invert and hide certain elements. So I can hide A, show A. So you can build a little palette of hiding elements um, as well. So just some really high level visibility control and high level geometry manipulation um, to get you started with Rhino. But um, essentially the reason I'm doing this is so that we can move on to future videos in Grasshopper, um, which I'm still learning as well. So probably in about a week or two, expect to see some preliminary Grasshopper tutorials to get you started. And they'll be focused towards Dynamo users so I will try to draw parallels between the two, just in case you've learnt Dynamo first like I have. Um, so thanks for watching today. Hopefully that helps give you a bit of a taste of Rhino and how it works, how the interface is set up and what you could potentially do with it. From here, I recommend you do a bit of research. Have a look around. There's a really strong community for the software. So see what you can find out. And also if you're really passionate about the software, um, leave comments down below. Give me suggestions for things to research because I'd love to make more videos and share and uh, just raise the general knowledge and exposure of the software um, as opposed to just Revit and Dynamo, which is what my channel's mostly focused on to date. Um, so thanks for watching today. Hopefully you got a lot out of that. Um, and I look forward to making more videos on what I think is going to be a really exciting piece of software for the channel. Um, so if you're not already following and subscribing, feel free to do so. And hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Take care. Bye.